This week on CGC Weekly, we'll be improving the glass shader tenfold by adding a little touch called dispersion. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of CGC Weekly here on the CG Cookie Blender Training YouTube channel. As stated in a little teaser segment before the intro, we are going to be creating a dispersion shader in Blender. But you might be wondering, what is a dispersion shader and how does it differ from a standard glass shader? Let's first look at what dispersion is. Odds are, at some point in your life, you've dealt with some sort of glass prism. Whether that be like an actual, just straight up cube that's glass, or something more like the edge of a window that might be beveled or something like that. Odds are, you might have noticed something cool as well. When you look at the corner of, say, a beveled piece of glass, you may notice that light, when it passes through, kind of gets broken up into a rainbow. This effect is called dispersion. By default, Cycles and all of its default glass or transparent shaders don't support dispersion because it's something that's very intensive, but it can get you some really cool results. Before we start creating the shader though, I want to first talk about why dispersion occurs. That way, while we're creating the shader, you guys actually understand what's going on. However, if you just want to just make the shader and you don't want to really learn about it, I mean, I guess you can click the time or skip to the timestamp that's displayed right here, but I'd strongly advise sticking around for the little, it'll be like a two minute physics lesson and that's all. Anyway, I'm gonna hop over to the whiteboard to get started. Ow. Oh, hello whiteboard. How kind of you to greet us today. So basically this cube is glass, we'll assume. And an incident light ray or a light ray that hasn't been affected by anything comes into our cube like so. Just like that, this light ray just enters. And when it reaches this boundary, right, between air and glass, something occurs. Because glass allows light to be transmitted through it, the light refracts. So refraction is something that occurs when light reaches a boundary between two different materials or mediums of different indices of refraction. In this case, air, being you know very non-optically dense as it is, has an IOR, or N, of 1.0003, which we can pretty much just assume is 1.00, so we'll just ignore that 03 part at the end. The cube of glass, however, has an IOR of, say, 1.450, and I know it's going to be kind of hard to see from where you are because you guys are kind of far away, but that's what it says, n equals 1.450. So, basically, this light travels from one medium to another. And when light transfers through different mediums, its speed changes. That's right, the speed of light isn't exactly what you think of. It actually isn't constant at all. Light can actually be slowed down quite a bit by changing the medium that it's passing through. Now the speed of light that most of you probably know, which is 300 kilometers per second, is the speed of light through a vacuum, where the IOR is equal to one. A little tidbit of information that's kind of important here is that IOR, which we'll use the letter N for, is equal to C, the universal constant or the speed of light, divided by the velocity of light in whatever medium it's in. So I'll use Vm there as our variable. For those of you who are math savvy, you know that means that IOR is a ratio of the speed of light to the speed of light through whatever medium it's going through. So since the speed of light in a vacuum is the speed of light, the ratio is 1.00 or you know an IOR of one. But when light is traveling through whatever medium this is, which has an IOR of 1.45, it's actually moving at about two-thirds the speed of light in a vacuum. So that's just a little overview of what IOR is. So because in this place, light is passing from an area of a lower IOR to an area of higher IOR, that means that the light is slowing down and the light will actually bend. For example, think about having a cup of water or you know pop or whatever, and you have a straw sitting in it. If you have that straw sitting in it and you look at the glass from the side, odds are that that straw will look completely detached from the straw that's sitting above the water or whatever liquid you have in the cup. And this is because water or whatever liquid you have in the cup has a different IOR than the surrounding air. So in this case, because the IOR is increasing, the angle at which the light is traveling will increase greatly. So before we have a pretty, you know, standard angle here, but by allowing it to pass through, it becomes significantly steeper. Now at the other boundary, right? We pass through one boundary here, and then it comes across this other boundary, and here light refracts once more. This time though, it's going from a high IOR to a lower IOR, meaning it'll have the opposite effect that it has here. So instead of the angle becoming steeper, the angle will become slightly less. 
Bada bing, bada boom, that's a curvy line, doesn't matter. So basically, this is how refracting works. Here's an interesting tidbit though. Not all light refracts the same way when it enters a medium. And what I mean by that is different IORs correspond to different wavelengths or colors of light. I've once again drawn our cube up here that we'll be using to refract light through. So let's say we have an incident ray of white light, right? And for those of you who are familiar with light, you'll know that white light is actually the combination of all the different colors of light, right? Its main components, though, are red, green, and blue, because these are what are called the additive primary colors. If you have light and you have a red, a green, and a blue light all shining on the same exact point, that light will become white. So anyway, this is white light, and it comes to our boundary here. And as I mentioned, not all colors of light will refract at the same rate. So n equals 1.450 is just for one specific color of light. In this case, we'll assume that light is green. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my green marker here, and I'll draw in our green line that has been refracted. So there we have green light, and you know, green light's cool and all, but what about the other two colors I just mentioned, red and blue? Well, red light usually doesn't refract quite as much as the others. So we'll draw this with a little bit less steep of an angle that kind of maintains the existing angle. And blue light, having a very high frequency or a very small wavelength, will refract a lot. So this light will move down just like that. So our light rays now encounter our second boundary. Well, Obviously, they need to regain this same exact shape, right? Because they're entering a different IOR. So we'll let that light go on its happy way through, just like so. And finally, our red light, which is actually a pink marker, but I couldn't find a good red marker. So basically, what we have here is white light entering, the light splitting due to an effect called dispersion, and then getting spit out in three separate areas. And if we look at this and it's some sort of like, you know, a real world counterpart, it might look something like this. It begins to form a rainbow. And of course, these colors would blend a little bit differently. It would be, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, all the way, you know, down to those. But there, there you have it. So we can kind of determine that red light, when it hits a boundary, has a lower IOR than the rest. Green light kind of has the middle ground IOR, and that blue always has the higher IOR. So let's hop back to my desk over here, and we'll start actually creating the dispersion shader, because I know that's kind of the point of this video and stuff. Hopefully that little lesson on physics wasn't too unbearable. I know that sometimes physics and math can get a little bit boring, but I think it's interesting, and it helps us a lot when we're building shaders. So I opened up Blender here, and because this is going to be a cycles dispersion shader, we do need to switch over from Blender Render to Cycles Rendering Engine, because that's marginally important. And what we'll do to get started is I'm actually going to leave everything in the scene like it is. I'm just going to split my window in two and get rid of these panels by pressing T. I'm gonna switch this left panel over to be the node editor, and we'll get rid of that panel by pressing N, and we'll start working on a material for our cube here. All right, so with my cube selected, you can see I have the default material loaded up, just a diffuse shader going into the surface input. So let's think about this in terms of physics, right? As we talked about before, each different color of light has a different index of refraction. So we need to create three different glass shaders, each corresponding to one different wavelength of light. In this case, we'll use red, green, and blue because those are the additive primary colors to create our shader. So we'll start off by creating three glass shaders. So I'll delete my diffuse shader here. Actually, we'll make this a little bit bigger because we don't need that much space over there. We'll add a glass shader and then we'll duplicate it by pressing shift D, not shift tab, shift D, there you go. And then all we'll do is add all three of these glass shaders together. Actually, no, before we do that, let's assign them to their colors, that way we don't lose track of them. The top one is going to be purely red. So in this RGB section here, I'm just going to drop the green and the blue all the way down to zero. This one's going to be green, so we'll drop red and blue down to zero. And then this last one is going to be pure blue, so we'll drop it like that. And make sure that whatever value that your color is, in this case, for example, green, make sure that's set to one. I think by default, it's sometimes set to 0.8. Make sure that it's set all the way to one because we want pure green and we want the full value of the color. If we switch into rendered mode over here, um, for one, I have an HDRI loaded up on this, but that doesn't really matter. Um, whether or not you have an HDRI loaded up, your cube should be black because we have nothing connected to our material output. 
What we're going to do is we're going to use add shader nodes to combine all three of these uh, shaders together. So at first we'll add the red and the green shader together using this add shader node. And then we'll duplicate this add shader node, plug the old add shader node into the top input of the new add shader node, and then plug the blue into the bottom input of that new add shader node. Then we'll take that shader output and plug it into the surface. And just like that, we have created probably the worst glass shader in the history of glass shaders because it is so incredibly horribly optimized. I mean, look at how noisy this cube is. That is just atrocious. But the trick is changing the IORs, right? We talked about when we were over at the whiteboard, the fact that each color has a different index of refraction when it's interacting with some sort of new medium. But in this case, all of the three colors IORs are set the same. They're all set to 1.45 which means that when these light particles refract, they're just refracting in the same path that the others do. And we wanna break that apart so that they can disperse. So in order to do that, we're going to set the red IOR slightly lower than the green IOR and the blue IOR slightly higher than the green IOR. So basically the green IOR is going to be our base IOR, then the red is going to be slightly lower and the blue is going to be slightly higher. Let's try this out. We'll change these, uh, we'll, we'll use an IOR offset of 0.05. So this will become 1.4 because it's 0.05 less than our base IOR. And we'll set this to 1.5 because it's 0.5 higher than our base IOR. And by doing this, you can begin to see really cool effects of dispersion occurring at the edges of our cube. And this is so cool. This is, when I first figured out how to do this, I was so excited because I'm a total physics nerd and seeing this and seeing dispersion replicated in an engine that doesn't support wavelengths is just, it's cool, it's cool. Anyway, uh, we need to make this a little bit easier to work with because right now we'd have to manually set each individual IOR. So in order to create a more encompassing, um, I don't know what to call it, a node group, a more encompassing node group, we're going to actually add in some like automation basically so that we can set one base IOR and the red and the blue IORs will be you know, calculated on their own. So in order to do this, I'm first going to create a node group. I'll press B to open up my box select tool and select all of the nodes except for the material output node. Then I'll press control G. Control G makes a node group and this gives us our group output node over here and our group input node over here. So there's a few things that we want to stay constant between all three of our glass shaders, and that's roughness and normal, right? So all we'll do is we'll connect those first. So we'll click and drag from this blank group input up to roughness. We'll connect roughness to all three of our glass shaders because we want all three of our glass shaders to have the same roughness. There's no reason they should differ. And the same goes for normal. So we'll connect the normal to all three of these. So you can see we just have one roughness input and one normal input that connects to all three of these shaders. And if we press tab to edit out of the group um, node, you can see here that we have that roughness and normal input now and the shader output. If for whatever reason this shader output didn't get hooked up automatically, all you need to do is just click and drag this onto this blank dot. Um, of course that blank dot will be one higher, but it should automatically do that if you followed exactly what I did there. All right, cool. So now we have our colors and our IOR inputs left. And we're actually not going to change the colors of our glass because we have to have these red, green, and blue values in order to accurately, you know, um, represent our dispersion. So all we need to do is compensate for this IOR offset. So in order to do that, we'll use math nodes. All right, so I'm going to move this group input back quite a bit so we have some extra room. And I'm going to press Shift A, come down to Converter, Math, and then we'll drop that in. And right now it's set to add, which means that we can offset something by a certain amount. So let's start by getting our IOR input. I'll click and drag from this um, blank input over here again and hook it up to the green IOR input. This will add our base IOR. And we can work with this IOR to either create a higher IOR for one shader or a lower IOR for another. And we can use these math nodes to choose how much we want to affect that. So if I plug in this IOR into the top input of our add shader up here, right? And I select subtract from the mode and change it to 0.05 and hook up this output into the input IOR shader of our glass shader. Basically that's taking the input value of 1.450, bringing it over here, subtracting, oops, didn't mean to check that, subtracting 0. Or 0.05 from it, right? Which means it's now 1.4 
and hooking that into this shader. So before, remember, we had an IOR of 1.4 here, and right now we're still getting an IOR of 1.4. We can do the same thing, except you know, in the opposite direction by duplicating this node and moving it down here, changing it to add, hooking up this IOR input into the top, and hooking up the value into our IOR output or our IOR input into our blue glass shader over here. And now we're just adding 0.05. So the input value of 1.45 comes in, 0 0.05 is added to it, so it's now 1.5, and it comes out into our glass shader. So now we can change the base IOR to whatever number we desire, for example, eight, but who would, that's like not okay, um, two for example, or 1.1 all sorts of different things, and we can get accurate dispersion from any IOR that we throw at it. But let's add one more layer of automation into it, and let's add a way that we can control how much we want things to be dispersed. This is actually pretty simple. All we need to do is add another input down here at the bottom. So I'll click and drag from this and hook it up to the bottom input of our subtract node up here, and the bottom input of our add node down here. This will allow us to control dispersion. Let me set this back to 1.45 here. So right now, our dispersion value is set to 0 0.05. But if I wanted this value to be higher, say 0.1, and I wanted to disperse more, we can change this value up more and more to create more and more dispersion in our glass shader, just like this. Of course, the name value is a little bit confusing, so let's actually give this a name. I'll press tab to go back into edit mode. I'll press N to open up this side panel, and we'll make it a little bit bigger. Here you can see all the different inputs and outputs from our node group. Right now, I want this value to be changed, I want to change its name to dispersion, right? And this is going to change the strength of this dispersion. I'm also going to drop the normal input down to the very bottom because that's where it is on most nodes, as you can see here. So basically, we have a roughness input, an IOR input, a dispersion input, and a normal input, and then a shader output. And you can see this on our node right here. So now we can basically change this to whatever value we want. So if I wanted this to be have an IOR of 1.8 and a dispersion factor of 0.5, you can see that we get these really strong dispersion effects throughout our entire model. And if we wanted to, we could increase the roughness to say 0.1, and we get this really cool looking cube. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do with this. So this is a really awesome shader. So hopefully you guys found this trick interesting. I know it's one of my favorite shaders to use. I use it like all the time. And hopefully you guys can adapt this into your own workflows. If you guys like these tips and you want more Blender content, don't be afraid to head over to cgcookie.com and hook yourself up with a citizen subscription. There's tons and tons of Blender, con like tons of Blender content available for you guys to learn from. Oh.